will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language center. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That mm -hmm. means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Oh. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes. But we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. Okay. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class, so remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow, but you'll need a notebook as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide giving a talk about a relaxation centre. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone, my name is Sally. Welcome to our globally renowned spa and relaxation centre here at Island View Estates. Before you all wander off and begin exploring the facilities, I'd like to go over a few things. Now this year is a very special milestone for our beloved centre as it is our 25th anniversary. I understand that this means you have all paid an increased price for your tickets but I can promise that all of the events we have scheduled for your enjoyment will make the costs well worth it. I know that all of you have travelled a long distance to make it here to the centre of the New Forest but it is thanks to its remoteness that our centre is such a beautiful place to relax. I'm sure you are all keen to find out what activities we have arranged for you, so I will give you a quick overview. Tomorrow we have arranged for you all to participate in a yoga session for the duration of the morning, followed by a day of relaxation at the pool where we have ample sun umbrellas to protect you from the sun. On Wednesday we have organised a sightseeing hike through the forest where you will be able to test your navigation skills and witness the wild ponies in their natural habitat. It's forecast to be sunny that day, but I recommend that you all bring rainproof clothes just in case. On your last day, we have a special surprise, a pony trek along the beach. We ask that you all wear full-length trousers and that all women have their hair tied up in a ponytail. Helmets are provided at the centre for those who would like to wear one. There are a couple of beautiful attractions here at the centre that you must all be sure to visit before you leave. The Rose Garden, located just at the corner of the property, is home to many indigenous species and is beautifully serene and peaceful, the perfect place to collect your thoughts or read a book. Our sunset boat ride has been the favourite attraction for many of our visitors. Simply hop aboard and relax whilst we sail you out into the open sea to witness one of the most beautiful spectacles that nature has to offer. Last, but certainly not least, is the freshwater pond, which serves as a watering hole of sorts. Some of you may even be lucky enough to spot our resident kingfishers, who are members of a very rare and endangered species. Once you have all unpacked and settled into your rooms, we will be taking you out to the neighbouring island for a bonfire and barbecue dinner. The island is very small and the bicycle trails make it very easy to explore all of its beautiful corners. As the island is entirely separate from the mainland, it has never been inhabited by wildlife, so you can all roam freely and safely. We have some bonding exercises for you all to take part in around the bonfire. 
where you can potentially make new friends and discover a lot about yourself. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you'll have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the facilities that the resort has to offer. For those of you keen on indulging in a little bit of retail therapy, just wander along to our tourist centre, where we have a wide selection of presents on sale at reasonable prices. If you are feeling more drawn to the natural surroundings and scenery, I recommend that you take a trek up the mountain where you can enjoy the panoramic outlook from the peak. For a bit of cultural indulgence, why not pay a visit to our small on-site theatre where you can enjoy watching a range of movies and check out some works by our resident street artists. Just a 10-minute walk down the road is the local art museum, where you can roam around the sculpture courtyard or admire the many artworks on display. Here at the resort, we are incredibly lucky to be located right next to a nature reserve, where many species of endangered wildlife live in the pond. Just on the bank is a small hut where visitors can observe the fish and birds in their natural habitat. Now, if any of you are interested in history, you have the very interesting opportunity to visit the ancient building at the south side of the grounds. The building is now a museum. However, it originally served as a jail for those charged with crimes of treason against the royal family. Well, that just about rounds it up. Now, if anyone has any questions... The end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. To hear a reporter from the New York Times who is presenting a news report prepared by Dion Cierci and Robert Gabaloff on the topic middle class shrinks. Further as more fallout instead of climbing up. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. The middle class that President Obama identified in his State of the Union speech last week as the foundation of the American economy has been shrinking for almost half a century. In the late 1960s, more than half of the households in the United States were squarely in the middle earning. In today's dollars, $35,000 to $100,000 a year. Few people noticed or cared as the size of that group began to fall. 
because the shift was primarily caused by more Americans climbing the economic ladder into upper income brackets. But since 2000, the middle class's share of households has continued to narrow. The main reason being that more people have fallen to the bottom. At the same time, fewer of those in this group fit the traditional image of a married couple with children at home, a gap increasingly filled by the elderly. This social upheaval helps explain why the president focused on reviving the middle class offering a raft of proposals squarely aimed at concerns like paying for college education, taking parental leave, affording childcare and buying a home. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Mr. Obama told Congress and the public, Still, regardless of their income, most Americans are identified as middle class. The term itself is so amorphous that politicians often cite the group in introducing proposals to engender white appeal. The definition here starts at $35,000, which is about 50% higher than the official poverty level for a family of four and ends at the six-figure mark. Although many Americans in households making more than $100,000 consider themselves middle class, particularly those living in expensive regions like the Northeast and Pacific Coast, they have substantially more money than most people. However, the lines are drawn. It is clear that millions are struggling to hang on to accoutrement that most experts consider essential to a middle-class life. I would consider middle-class to be people who can live comfortably on what they earn, can pay their bills, can set aside something to save for retirement and for kids in college, and can have vacations and entertainment, said Christine L. Ovens, Executive Director of the National Employment Law Project. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about a research project on the tiger shark. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 7 and 8.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on the tiger shark. First of all, some background information. The tiger shark, also known as the leopard shark, is often thought to have got its name from its aggressive nature. But in actual fact, it's called that because it has dark bands similar to those on a tiger's body. It is a huge creature, growing up to lengths of six and a half meters. It can be found just about everywhere throughout the world's temperate and tropical seas, but it is most often found along the coast rather than the open sea. In terms of feeding, tiger sharks tend to be most active at night and are solitary hunters. Their preferred prey includes other sharks, turtles, seabirds, and dolphins, to name but a few. However, it's not uncommon to find garbage in its stomach. This is because it tends to feed in areas such as harbors and river inlets, where there is a lot of human activity. Now to the project itself. We are particularly interested in some studies that have been done in the Rain Island area. Observations here have shown that there is a large population of tiger sharks present in the summer during the turtle nesting season. However, during the winter months, the sharks disappear. So we decided to do some of our own research there. The first step was to tag a number of sharks so that we could follow their movements. To do this, we first needed to catch the sharks. Early in the morning, we baited lines with large bits of fish and set them in place. These lines were then checked every three or four hours. If no sharks were caught, the baits were replaced. Once a shark had been caught on one of the baited hooks, it was pulled in close to the boat and secured so that we could carry out a number of brief activities to aid our research. This usually took no more than about ten minutes and was carried out as carefully as possible to minimize any stress to the shark. Each of the tiger sharks that we caught was measured and fitted with an identification tag and also a small amount of tissue was taken for genetic studies. For some larger sharks over three meters long, we also inserted into the belly a special acoustic tag capable of sending satellite signals, while on other large sharks we attached a camera to the dorsal fin to enable us to study the behavior and habitat use of the sharks. After this, the shark was released, and we were able to follow its movements. So what was the purpose of all this tagging? Well. While we were already familiar with some aspects of the tiger shark's behavior and food sources, what we hoped to do in this project was to see exactly what factors affected the migration patterns of tiger sharks and whether it was, in fact, food, weather, and reproductive needs. These are some of our findings. On February 21st, a large female shark, whom we named Natalie, was attracted to our research boat at the northern tip of Rain Island and fitted with one of the satellite tags I've just mentioned. No transmissions were received from Natalie between April 2nd and April 29th, indicating that she didn't surface to feed during this period. The area in which she was last reported is very shallow, suggesting that she may have changed her feeding preferences during this period to focus on prey found on the sea floor. We also made a number of other discoveries, thanks to the various transmitters we used. It seems that tiger sharks move back and forth between the ocean floor and the surface quite often. This may help the sharks conserve energy while they swim, but it probably also helps them hunt, since this movement back and forth maximizes its chances of not being detected by its prey until the last minute. So far, our findings have not been conclusive. However, we have gained some very interesting insights into the behavior of tiger sharks and are now hoping to develop our research further.
That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.